Hello everyone, what a fun coincidence that our episode is being released on Valentine's Day. We actually have a few things to tell you about the history of Valentine's Day, but before I forget, I want to remind you that this weekend is the great backyard bird count. I hope you can spare at least 15 minutes to count birds in your backyard. You can count just for one day, or you can count all four days. Just don't forget to log your data with eBird. And now let's talk about Valentine's Day. Have you ever wondered why it falls on the 14th of February? Well, according to European folklore, it was believed, especially in England and France, that birds started singing profusely right in the middle of February, looking, you know, for that love of their short life, their mates. And because there were no printed calendars around, people kept track of days according to what saint was associated with that day. Date. And the 14th, being the middle of the month, happened to fall on the day when two saints by the name of Valentinus died. There was another belief that depending on what type of bird a young unmarried woman sees on Valentine's Day, that's the kind of man she would marry. And remember, these are European birds. So check this out. If she sees a blackbird, she will marry a man of the cloth. A goldfinch, a wealthy man. A sparrow, a countryman, a robin, a man of the sea, and if she sees a woodpecker, no man at all. Erica Schurdezecker is wondering why would a male cardinal sing relentlessly for three weeks in December? Hi, Erica. Thank you for your observation of that male cardinal belting out its song for three weeks in December. And yes, you are right that normally in spring, the males sing to attract females and to defend their territory against unwanted competitors. So why would they call in midwinter? Well, lucky for you, I, I've actually witnessed myself this behavior while living in Montreal. A male cardinal singing its heart out in a treetop on a bright sunny day with the snow melting. However, it still was midwinter and I do recall being surprised. While some songbird species do utter chipping calls to keep a flock together and basically let each other know of their presence, it's not every day they actually break out into a full-blown song. And northern cardinals are not alone. Other birds like black-capped chickadees, northern mockingbirds, and fox sparrows do the same. Some studies, including one on the great warbler, which winters in Africa, have claimed that the birds are practicing their songs for the arrival of spring. But I like this explanation instead. The birds' eyeballs, brains, and endocrine systems are responding to the increasing length of day. That's what triggers breeding in the spring. So when birds like cardinals perceive longer periods of daylight, especially on bright days, even in midwinter, it stimulates their sensory and hormonal systems, which in turn stimulates them to sing. And when the weather turns overcast, as it inevitably does, they go silent again. It does take energy to do all that singing, so doing it for the entire winter would not make sense. Anyway, that's the current explanation, and keep in mind that sometimes birds simply sing for the pure joy of it. With mounting pressure to compensate for a pending loss of nuclear power, coal plants, and Russian gas, Germany is banking more and more on green energy like wind turbines. But creating large fields of wind turbines in appropriately windy regions can come with a cost. The killing of large birds, which also depend on the wind. For instance, lesser spotted eagles, down to only 130 breeding pairs left in Germany, commonly ride the thermals over the flatlands, now chosen for a mass expansion of onshore wind farms. However, because the eagle's eyes are usually focused on the landscape below in search of mice and lizards, they don't perceive the danger of the spinning blades on these vertical obstacles until it's too late. Since 2002, at least eight specimens have been found dead near the turbines. While the number might seem small, it can be significant to the overall population of the lesser spotted eagle. Equally important, citizens opposed to wind farms for other reasons have learned to use the eagle's plight as a weapon to argue against the expansion. Enter artificial intelligence, commonly referred to as AI. Software engineers employed by a company called Identiflight in Colorado to create an anti-collision system have fed hundreds of thousands of images of the lesser spotted eagle into an algorithm and linked it into a field camera system placed on top of a 10 meter tower. The camera is expected to detect eagles approaching from a distance of up to 750 meters away 
and then electronically alert a given turbine. The turbine then takes 20 to 40 seconds to slow down by about two rotations a minute, which gives the eagles lots of time to pass safely between the slower moving blades. So far, the system has worked well by recognizing and classifying more than 90% of approaching red kites, the first test bird studied in Germany. Turbine companies hope to employ Identiflight for lesser spotted eagles in 2023, the first of 15 bird species targeted it. With the world turning increasingly more and more to wind energy, let's hope that this new technology to prevent bird collisions works well. Did you know that Dr. David Bird studied American kestrels for years? He's basically a walking encyclopedia on American kestrels. We often see them perched on wires when driving along highways. They're also quite fond of urban areas, so don't be surprised if you see one in your backyard or in a local park. They are in desperate need of nesting boxes, so if your habitat allows that, please put one up. They will start breeding uh, in about a month or so, so now is the time to do that. I've just found a box online and ordered it, but if you're handy, you can actually build one yourself. Cornell's Nestwatch site has downloadable plans, so check them out if you feel like building a nesting box yourself. American kestrels are rather small, sort of the size of morning doves. In the past, I've actually mistaken them for morning doves perched on wires around here. One thing to look out for in American kestrels is black lines under their eyes. It's actually, uh, that looks like mascara running down their face. And males have these beautiful grayish blue wings, which females don't. They mostly eat anthropods and um, small vertebrates, and sometimes they will take small birds. Whatever is not eaten, they tend to cache it, though I don't really know how they manage to preserve a half-eaten bird. Throughout the year, they are present in most U.S. states, migrating to some northern states and Canada to breed. There is nothing really unusual about their breeding. They normally have one brood per season, and they lay four to five eggs per clutch. Well, I hope you had a chance to check out all the cute pictures of birds that were submitted on our February photo contest. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. March is Feeding Frenzy. All right, everyone, it's time to say goodbye. I hope you'll be able to count birds at least on one of the days from February 17th to the 20th. Next episode, it's still a for American Bittern. If you have pictures, videos, or any stories about this funky heron, please send them over. We'll happily share them with everyone. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks. Bye.